The treatment of coronary artery disease has a lot of overlap between acute coronary syndromes and chronic stable disease. The major difference is, is that in long-term management of coronary disease, we're not using certain forms of anticoagulation, such as the heparins and the thrombolytics. Heparins, thrombolytics, factor 10A inhibitors, such as fondaparinux, are all for acute coronary syndromes. Now, the concept of there being chronic stable angina is uh, a passe term. It's a passe term. The, used to be, uh, for instance, uh, uh, up until the time even when I was a medical student, they used to talk to us about, well, tell a patient to take some sublingual nitroglycerin and if after the third sublingual nitroglycerin the pain doesn't go away, it's time to come to the emergency department. Oh, but this is absurd. You, we would never be leaving someone to just uh, have chest pain at home waiting to see if they infarct while walking up a flight of stairs into their house. It's absurd. There is no such thing as like, the claudication of peripheral arterial disease, where you just say to people, well, you know, just walk until you have pain. Like, oh, just keep walking around until you have chest pain. It's absurd. You have to fix the pain. So there are medications we use to keep it suppressed, but the idea of a chronic stable angina, that's a little weird. You got, well, it's like chronic stable, you know, kleptomania, you know? Well, you know, uh, let them keep stealing until they get caught the third time. No. So everybody gets an aspirin. Now, it's not a full dose aspirin, it's half the usual dose or baby aspirin. Our boards don't test dosing much, but if they do say, if there is something along the line saying dosing, it don't need a full aspirin because we don't want to screw up people's stomachs. That's why the idea of saying everybody with diabetes should be on an aspirin, everybody with hypertension should just be on an aspirin, everybody over the age of 50 and 60 should be on an aspirin, never really flew because you end up with GI bleeds and other forms of bleeding that are not good just to be on a higher dose of the aspirin. So you don't need more than 80 or 100 milligrams to fully block cyclooxygenase. Now everybody should be on a beta blocker. Now although there's a lot of beta blockers, atenolol, metoprolol, natalol, propranolol, labetalol, carbetalol, Really, the beta blocker that we're using in cardiology is metoprolol. Um, that is because it's a beta-1 specific drug, and 70% of people who have asthma can actually tolerate that beta-1 specific drug, at least 70%. Remember, it's better to be alive using more inhalers than dead with a normal FEV1. So you should try it even if you have COPD and asthma. 70% have no adverse effects, even in asthma. We use nitrates to relieve symptoms, but the biggest difference is nitrates don't lower mortality. Beta blockers and aspirin lower mortality. So the thing that they're gonna wanna know from you most of all is that you know which drugs lower mortality. For instance, those people who've had any form of percutaneous coronary intervention, stenting and balloons and percutaneous coronary intervention, all need a second platelet drug. They all need a second anti and second antiplatelet drug because it prevents you from restenosing. Whether that is prasugrel, ticagrelor, or clopidogrel. Now, if you're not gonna get stented, clopidogrel, for those who are not gonna be stented, is the standard of care, or the second antiplatelet drug, particularly with acute coronary syndromes. Prasugrel and ticagrelor are exclusively only for those people who are gonna get stented. And these are second antiplatelet drugs, P2Y12. P2Y12 drugs, P2Y12 drugs. Prasugrel is relatively contraindicated in the elderly, not in the older. What does elderly mean to you? It means above the age of 70 or 75 because of more bleeding. You can't use prasugrel in skinny people, people who might bleed. Oh, who gets an ACE and an ARB? When are angiotensin receptor blockers better than ACE inhibitors? And the answer is never. Angiotensin receptor blockers are never better. We use them when somebody has a cough from ACE inhibitors 
or somebody can't tolerate the ACE inhibitors, they both cause hyperkalemia. So ACE inhibitors is always first. Who gets combined ACE and ARB? When are you going to combine them? Never. Nice idea. Just doesn't help. So ACE and ARB are for people mostly who have a low ejection fraction. We use them in acute coronary syndromes because we don't know who's going to have a low ejection fraction later on. But ACE inhibitors do not have to be on for everybody with coronary disease. They're good for valvular disease, regurgitant lesions, and when there's a low ejection fraction, congestive failure. But just because of coronary disease, that's what we're using. Aspirin, a beta locker, nitrates, just for coronary disease. Oh, you're getting a stent, getting angioplasty, get a second drug. Oh, you have a low ejection fraction, ACE and ARB, never combined. ARB is never better. You use it when there's a contraindication like a cough. Next is, next is something called ranolazine. Ranolazine is a sodium channel anti-anginal drug. It's a sodium channel blocker, anti-anginal drug, and it's useful. It can actually be used as a first-line agent. It could be. Ranolazine is a sodium channel blocker, and it's for sure. Why does it end up being last here? Because where we have it slotted in our brains now is that if somebody's on aspirin and beta blockers and nitrates, and they're still getting chest pain, ranolazine for sure. Could it be used first? Yes, it could be used first. It could be used first. Well, Let's take a little journey on over to lipid land. Lipid land is very difficult for us now. The guidelines are very hard to be able to understand. And so therefore, you may see in a lot of publications, people choosing to still stick around with targeted for LDL levels because there's still validity to it. And if you read three sources, you'll see two different recommendations. So what do we know for sure? We know for sure that anybody who has coronary disease should get an LDL goal that should be at least under 100. Coronary disease and diabetes should be under 70. You could say, what does it matter about targeted stuff when you should just be using high intensity statins? And we agree with this. That's going to be your keyword. You see this? Okay, you're going to be like having a relationship with somebody who's bipolar. High intensity. What's the answer? For what? Everything. High intensity. So you should be at least an LDL under 100. If you have diabetes and coronary disease under 70, peripheral arterial disease is equivalent to coronary disease, aortic disease, not aortic valve, and carotid disease should be at least under 100 for all of these, and high-intensity statin. And high-intensity statin means atorvastatin or rosuvastatin at high dose. At high dose, high dose of these. That's what it means. Or anybody who has a greater than 7.5% chance of coronary disease. But since we're in the coronary disease section, talking about a 7.5% chance of coronary disease over 10 years is not too relevant because you have coronary disease. So we should be bringing it down at least to this. Now the question about second lipid drug is that there really is no answer. What do you do for a second lipid drug like niacin? Niacin, we know, has some glucose abnormalities and some uric acid abnormalities. That's very true. Niacin, we know, makes you itchy. Releases histamine in the skin. That's for sure. Niacin, we know, can raise your glucose and the uric acid. That's for sure. Should we use it as a second lipid drug? Is it a substitute? Probably not. What are they going to ask you since they don't do probabilities? They'll ask you something that we can always say for sure. See, adverse effects is always for sure. Adverse effects is always for sure because you don't have to agree with them. They're just the way it is. Oh, let's see, fibric acid derivatives. Fibric acid derivatives, we know they have the highest risk of myositis when combined with statins. Okay, the highest risk of myositis combined with statins. Do they lower mortality? Oh, no. When should they be used? Not clear. 
Oh, what about hyperlipidemia, hypertriglycerides? No, statins first with hypertriglycerides. Well, wouldn't they answer? I don't know. Ezetimibe. Ezetimibe lowers LDL, lowers triglycerides. When should it be used? I don't know. What's the adverse effect? None. No adverse effect. When should it be used? I don't know. Does it lower mortality? Definitely not. Definitely not. So what do we do about these second lipid drugs? We don't know. Cholestyramine, niacin, ezetimibe. We know the adverse effects, and those are your questions. Don't forget to send me chocolate when you see it on the test, because what else are you going to ask about when it's not clear whether they even should be used at all? They're going to ask you things that have to be clear. In other words, what is the most common adverse effect of statins? What's the most common adverse effect of statins? The most common wrong answer is myositis. Liver dysfunction is 10 to 20 times more than muscle dysfunction. The most common adverse effect of statins is liver dysfunction is 10 or 20 times, is 10 or 20 times more than the muscle problems. Liver is much more. There's a clear question for you. What drug should you go to if you can't tolerate it? It's not clear, not clear, not clear. Hmm. Well, you see, here's a clear question for you. When do calcium channel blockers lower mortality in coronary disease? And the answer is never. Calcium channel blockers have never been shown to lower mortality in coronary disease. Never? But I thought we used them with Prince Metals angina. I thought we used them with um, uh, people who have asthmatics, who are asthmatics or use cocaine. I thought we used them with Prince metals or asthmatics or cocaine. Prince metals or asthmatics with cocaine. Prince metals asthmatics with cocaine. Prince metals asthmatics with cocaine. Yes, that's when we use them. But when do they lower mortality with coronary disease? They don't. They don't. We want them to, but they don't. Diprotamol in the heart is useless as a therapy. Diprotamol in the heart, useless as a therapy. So, angioplasty. We use it more in one and two vessel disease. When does it lower mortality? ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. When does it lower mortality? ST elevation myocardial infarction. Coronary artery bypass. This is ultimately why we're catheterizing people. It lowers mortality when three vessels have greater than 70% in each vessel, 70% in each vessel, or left main coronary disease with greater than 70%, greater than 70%, or two coronary vessels in a person who has diabetes. Dangerous diseases require dangerous cures, says Hippocrates. So what we have summarized here in this very short section is to show you everything that you need to know about the medications and what's always wrong. We use calcium blockers in Prince Metals asthmatics or people who can't, who take beta blockers because we're worried about cocaine use. But when do they lower mortality? They don't. Statins, guidelines, hard to understand. Coronary disease, gets them at high intensity. See you in the next section.